let's just do a brief, you all sort of already met me at the patient panel, um, but let's do a brief introduction with everyone here. Try to keep it around like a minute each. Hi, everyone. I'm Anastasia Vishnevetsky. I'm a, a neurologist at Mass General Hospital. It was also Michael Levy's first fellow at Mass General. Uh, so very excited to be here. Uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, in different symptoms, uh, folks with NMOSD and MOGAD might experience, so particularly pain, spasticity, headaches, uh, and also working on some studies related to cannabinoids in NMOSD and MOGAD. Um, Marcelo Mattiello, um, neurologist at Mass General with interest in um, clinical aspects and treating patients with NMOSD, MOGAD, MS, and other neuroimmunological diseases. Yes, there we go. I'm just Belkis Martin Pais. I go by Josie. And for my patients, just to make their life easier, Dr. Martin, I am a neuro ophthalmologist at Tufts Medical Center, a neuroimmunologist at BI Lehi. And I see, I mean, I tend to wear two hats neuro op and neuroimmunology, and I do see in patients with NMOSD, MOGAD, and MS. Hi, I am Dr. Kina Peppers, and I am a physician, but I'm also a patient. I was diagnosed with NMO in 2015, where I was intubated, then I was blind and paralyzed. So, of course, my interest, I'm so happy to be here today amongst all of you who are basically all going through the same things, and um, it is a journey. However, we can get it done together. Thank you all so much. Um, it's very cool that you are a patient and working in medicine now. Um, so I just wanted to get us started by talking about some common symptoms and maybe comorbidities um, that go along with those symptoms in both NMOSD and MOGAD. I'll have Dr. Vishnevesky start us off. Great, so I think some of the symptoms that are most problematic um, in NMOSD and MOGAD are neuropathic pain that folks talked about uh, a lot here. I think the fatigue, um, spasticity or muscle spasms, muscle cramps, all of that kind of goes under the umbrella um, of what we call spasticity uh, as well. And then I think uh, this is something that can occur in NMOSD as well as MOGAD, but I think is particularly common in individuals with MOGAD, and that's uh, headaches and eye pain. Uh, and that's something that uh, we see much more in folks who uh, have the MOG antibody than we see in folks with MS um, or in folks with NMOSD. So um, those are some of the comorbidities or some of the symptoms that we focus on uh, the most. One of the things I think about in terms of just the uh, approach with patients and kind of setting expectations, especially for people who are just starting on a therapy early on, is that there's not uh, a single medication that works best for everyone. You'll hear some people here talk about a medication. I think I heard someone mention uh, pre, uh, Lyrica. Uh, and for some people, that's really, really effective. And other people will have a lot of side effects, not find it effective. The dosing is different. And so from the beginning, just setting expectations that it's a bit of a journey to find the right set of medications for each person that best balances kind of side effects as well as efficacy, and that it's kind of important to work closely with your doctor from the beginning and not expect necessarily that the first medication you try is going to be the, uh, the most effective. Yeah, um, in, the same <clears throat> in the same way, I al also think about uh, bowel and bladder dysfunction or sexual dysfunction as one of the the cornerstones of helping uh, patients with, with uh, NMO or MOGAD. <clears throat> what was talked in the previous panel as well, fatigue or brain fog or inability to stay healthy or, or stay active the same way that they, uh, patients would 
have done before. And finally, um, how to approach the disability that is directly driven by either optic neuritis, we heard before uh, visual deficits or, or inability to uh, drive <clears throat> or to do activities that they once could with the vision. Inability to move or, or to be able to, mobility is a, is a major core uh, um, area of interest of us helping our patients. Um, but similar to what Dr. Vishnevitsky explained, um, pain is the, uh, probably in my experience, the most difficult to treat. And um, it can come in various forms. It can come as a, a spasticity or tonic spasms. They're quite, quite severe and quite painful. Or they can come as a permanent or continuous uh, type of symptom. And it's described as burning, electrical shooting, prickly. Um, and uh, we always trying to find a balance between efficacy and, and side effects. And, and of course, um, the cost of treatment and, and how people feel on when they are on so many medications. I just want to make a distinction between comorbidities and symptomatic management. So we all know that at least 30% of patients with NMOSD, they do have comorbidities, meaning a different, another additional diagnosis, and could be just more than one. What I like to tell my patients is the fact that you have one autoimmune disease doesn't protect you to have others. And it's something that oftentimes we tend to forget because we are so focused on treating that condition that we forget to mention that, I mean, patients also, they are at higher risk of having not just NMOSD, but autoimmune thyroid disease Sjogren syndrome, and among others. So now, when we come to symptoms, symptoms is something that we need to address at every visit. In my experience, and something that I have learned, is when you see your patient in clinic and you ask them, anything new since the last you saw me? They always gonna answer no. You need to see, you need to be very specific and I have my list because I mean, and you know, it's, it's very interesting because the first answer that I get from them is everything is the same. And then when I go down all the symptoms that we previously mentioned, like fatigue, sexual dysfunction, bladder and bowel, memory, vision problems, and pain, they tend to check all the boxes. So I think that our role as a provider is go through those symptoms even when patients, they do not mention, even when they tend to, or at least when they said everything is a step. So the reason why I started with the comorbidities is because when it comes to visual symptoms, everything is not optic neuritis. That's a presenting symptoms. But we need to remember that the way that we treat acute attacks in NMOSD, MOGAD, is steroids. When it comes to MOGAD, so it's a long-term prednisone treatment that it leads, can lead to increased intraocular pressure. So there is also other conditions that are more severe. If baseline you have dry eyes, that is gonna make it worse. So that's, how, that's always, I always said, so if you are on acute treatment, you need to get your eyesight, you need to see your neuro-ophthalmology while you're going through treatment. But most importantly, if you ever have a new visual complaint, you wait for us to say, if this is an optic neuritis or we are dealing with something else. Thank you. So of course I'm speaking as the patient but initially when I was diagnosed, it was as if my body had read the book. So I came in with intractable hiccups, 
and I quickly deteriorated and started having weakness in my upper and lower extremity, then had respiratory failure, was intubated, and then I was blind and paralyzed. So just bouncing off of what was said already, I already had Sjogren's. So I had Sjogren's syndrome, and um, when having Sjogren's, you know, everyone talks about the dry eyes and the dry mouth. However, I had all of the neurologic symptoms that went along with Sjogren's. So I already felt like a pin cushion, and I had the stabbing pin needles. And at that time, with hospitalization, all of my organs were failing, and they had difficulty controlling my temperature. So it, it's so funny how initially they tried to tie things into my Sjogren's when I started having the pin pricking and all of a sudden my legs went out and I was able to get to the right place at the right time. And going back to when you said, someone else said something about um, having the, the fatigue. So... <laughs> Having the Sjogren's on top of having the NMO, the fatigue is, you know, it, it, it's, it's tough, it's hard. And, you know, someone else mentioned modafinil, which a lot of times modafinil is my friend, but sometimes modafinil, I feel like it doesn't work. And, um, and I know this, this may not, have, you know, be the same for everybody, but what really, what really helps with me is exercise. And, you know, I, I figure when I get up in the morning, I take that pre-workout drink that gives me that boost just to make it to the gym. And those endorphins that I get from my workout, for me, the workout is like my wusa. The workout is, you know, what gives me the energy that makes it through the day. So, you know, it, it's other ways that you can, you know, get around everything. You just kind of have to figure out, you know, what works for you. It's like going to the grocery store and looking for some bread. And you walk into the bread aisle and it's like, oh, my goodness, there's wheat, there's rye. There's so many different types of things that, that you may like or they may, <laughs> they may like you. So sometimes it's a matter of figuring out, you know, what works for you. Great, thank you all. Um, is there anything you wanted to add before I ask a follow-up? Okay. Um, so, Dr. Martin Paez, I really appreciated what you added to that and the distinction between comorbidities and other symptoms. Um, you did mention that in NMOSD, there seems to be more overlap with comor you know, other conditions. And what I've read has said that that is more common in NMO, aquaporin-4 positive NMO, maybe even negative, but less common in MOGAD. I, as a patient, and have talked to many patients, have not had that experience. I've had seen many, many MOGAD patients who have multiple conditions. Um, can you guys just please speak to that and sort of what you're learning about all of this? So... We were, I mean, I was talking about the overlapping with autoimmune conditions on NMOSD. Yeah. So your question or the concern if, if I seen that in my daily practice when it comes to MOGAD, not that much of associated comorbidities, others that we, I mean, general population and according to demographics they're going to have, like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. So, but specifically when it comes to other autoimmune disease, that's not my experience. But I have to say, anxiety and depression, for sure, they are. Yes. Okay, thank you. Has anyone? Yeah, I think uh, part of your, uh, the answer is that we know about NMO aquaporin-4 for a longer time, and there are many more studies looking into uh, other autoimmune conditions. We heard Sjogren's, lupus, 
uh, thyroid disease, autoimmune hepatitis, myasthenia gravis. Um, and in MOGAD, I think the, the, that type of knowledge is still coming. Um, the one uh, opportunity is how to fit the, the medications we use to prevent one condition to prevent the others. Um, one interesting fact, though, is that it seems that for MOGAD attacks, they're usually more related to a previous infection or previous boost of the immune system. Um, and we think that's to allow some of those antibodies that are circulating in the blood to cross the blood-brain barrier, the, the, the barrier between the blood and the brain, and cause the attack. In NMOSED, that does not seem to be necessary. So, um, of course, we try to prevent and treat infections every single time, but it does seem more likely that infections are triggering MOGAD attacks in a higher sense than triggering NMOSD. Thank you. So we'll move on to some questions about management of these um, comorbid conditions or symptoms. I'm going to start with Dr. Vishnevetsky about like headache and eye pain um, and some, I know you're doing some cannabis research, so maybe sharing a little about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think for, uh, with MOGAD uh, in particular uh, and headaches, I think we've been seeing just a lot of patients who present sometimes long before their first attack or before a relapse with eye pain or even with just a general headache. Um, for sometimes weeks or months before they get an attack of optic neuritis. And then also uh, some people experience pain for a much longer period of time than we would expect after the optic neuritis. Part of that we think is related to the fact that there's actually inflammation, um, not just in the optic nerve itself, but in the sheath surrounding the optic nerve. Um, so that's called perineuritis. And that can be particularly painful. We don't have targeted symptom or targeted uh, treatments for that particular kind of headache or that particular kind of eye pain, unfortunately. And I think it's actually an area that's really under studied and underappreciated. Um, but I think it's important to at least try to treat those uh, symptoms with he the typical headache um, kind of arsenal that we have. There's a lot of medications that are effective for headaches um, and uh, you know, if you it, sometimes if it's just called eye pain or if it's kind of too closely um, connected to the acute attack and expect it to just go away on its own, we don't treat it aggressively enough. So advocating for if you're having eye pain or headache for months uh, after an attack to actually get that treated, even if it's with just migraine medications, uh, I think that's important. Um, the other thing is that for some people, Actually treating the uh, onset of the eye pain with steroids can be effective. That's a slippery slope because steroids have a lot of their own side effects as well. But I think that that's a discussion to have with, uh, with your neurologist or your neuro-ophthalmologist about what's the point at which you're kind of worried about this being an impending attack and what's the point at which you want to actually treat this with, um, with immunotherapy or try to treat it with immunotherapy. Um, and I think that it's a particularly challenging area because I do think this is different. You know, a lot of um, neuroimmunologists, we trained with the paradigm of multiple sclerosis, and this just isn't as common of a symptom. This isn't something we see as commonly in multiple sclerosis. And so I think, you know, the uh, teaching is always headaches are not a symptom of multiple sclerosis or headaches are not um, uh, one of the kind of... Um, one of the typical uh, things pe that people experience because of their MS, they might experience it separately. But I think that that's different um, for patients uh, experiencing MOGAD. So I think that's important to appreciate. Um, and then on the cannabis um, front, I, I've started to systematically ask patients about if they're using any canna um, cannabis-based products because I've found that a lot of people are and a lot of people aren't talking to their physicians about it. To me, it's like any other drug or medication in the sense that for some people it works, other people it doesn't, some people experience side effects, others don't. And it's just something that unfortunately the medical establishment hasn't been able to study because of all of the regulations attached to cannabis. 
And so it's been a real source of frustration for me when patients ask, you know, if they ask about gabapentin, what are the side effects? What's the data? What's the efficacy? I can answer those questions. And when they ask about cannabis, I can't. I can't even say how many people are using it, what are the um, most common kinds of formulations people are using, what are the most common dosages, what treatment, what, what symptoms are they targeting. So we're actually launching a survey um, probably within the next week. I think many of you guys might be getting an email from Sumaira, so look out for it, um, addressing a lot of these questions and trying to understand better how you know, how all of you, how our patient population in general is using cannabis products um, and answering kind of the questions of how effective it's been, how many people are experiencing side effects, what are those side effects, what are the strategies um, that they're use, you know, using to deal with that, and also, you know, how many people are not, you know, see the, the kind of legal status, the lack of ability to talk to a physician about it as a barrier, um, and just how, how much farther do we have to go in terms of learning about it. So, I, unfortunately, there's really no studies kind of systematically assessing um, the efficacy of cannabinoids. The one piece of data we do have is that there's a cannabinoid-based pharmaceutical drug that's available for the treatment of drug-resistant spasticity related to multiple sclerosis that's approved in Europe and many countries outside of Europe. Um, so that's a little bit of data. Great, thank you. Um, and so now let's talk a little bit about the management of physical symptoms and please chime in if you guys have any other comments about management of vision or eye pain or anything. Um, I'm not gonna call on someone, but someone take it away. So the question is um, on physical. Um, Rehabilitation services available or anything that the patient can. Need. No, that's a, a key part of the the treatment is uh, being able to count upon um, rehabilitation experts, and that varies from uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, uh, in some rare instances, speech pathology or swallowing experts. And um, of course, um, psychotherapists or, or cognitive behavior therapists to help with a mood disorder or, or depression is, is very key, key, of key importance. In our practice, we, are benef we benefit from having colleagues in a large institution, which is a Spalding Rehab, but we also know that there are other rehabilitations that are just wonderful. We, um, of course, prefer that our patients see experts in neurology. Uh, the type of treatments they get is different then uh, physical therapists or occupational therapists specialize in sports medicine or orthopedics. Um, and organizing all this is, is a no simple task. So um, I also always think about the, the team and a patient is the captain, the physician is, is a co-pilot or a co-captain, um, but along with the nurse, along with um, the entire support system, the family, the friends, the advocates, the, you know, the, the therapists, and so on. Um, of course, this is not cheap either, right? So um, navigating medical insurances and, and pre-authorizations and peer-to-peer, and -peer, it's, it's becoming more difficult for us um, as we are trying to... Um, be available for clinical issues, but also available for paperwork. But um, uh, I often find that um, that energy and that perseverance and that resilience in my patients, and that's why um, I think our team members are ready to fight, right? Um, but uh, just seeing patients who have access to rehabilitation and how well they do uh, inspire us. you have more comments, please, please share. And I just wanted to, I just wanted to comment on the importance of rehabilitation because when I was in the intensive care unit, they came by to help me to walk. And when they set me up in the bed, not knowing, you know, how flaccid I was, 
my entire body fell forward. And they put my arms around their neck and when they picked me up to put me in the chair, my legs were like a raggedy hand dowel. And when they put me in the chair, I couldn't even sit up. I had absolutely no tone and my head hang down, hung down so I could not even hold my head up. So of course, me leaving the intensive care unit, going over to rehabilitation was utmost important for me. And at that point, I had to be turned, I had to be cleaned, I had to be dressed, I had to be fed. And when I made it to the point where I was able to sit up, I was so excited to start rehabilitation because I felt like when the doctors told me that I may not walk again, I may not see again, and I may not practice medicine again, I felt like I had to take the power that was within me and I had to prove them wrong because I feel like sometimes, not trying to be funny, but you know, you have to believe in a higher power and believing in God put it in me that I would be able to do those things again. And so when they would come to see me, I, a lot of it is a lot of mind over matter that when they came to see me in the morning, I was so excited, like, please get me dressed. Please, what are we doing next? What do I have to do? What do I have to prove today? What is it that I'm gonna do so that I could then continue to advance? So the physical therapists were blown away at one, the attitude that you have to know that you were going to make it. And when I started to be able to walk, I wore my glasses because I had worn glasses since I was four years old. And they would ask me, why are you wearing your glasses? Because you're blind. And I would tell them that I was wearing my glasses because I know when God restored my vision, I wanted it to be with clarity. So I continue to wear my glasses and I continue to allow the machine to pick me up from my wheelchair and help me to walk. And every single step that you take is a victory. So you have to always, those small things that you do, celebrate every single thing. Everything is a win and just never ever give up and never let someone tell you what can't be done. I just want to say something. I hope that that was the last time that you saw that team, right? Because we are here to encourage our patient and to walk with them in this journey. So I just want to say that I a huge believer in occupation and in physical therapy. And because it's patient's day, I want to turn this to the patient. So how many of you ever heard about BDNF? B-D-N-F, Brain Derivate Neurotrophy Factor. So BDNF is the fuel for the neurons and thus prolong neuronal survival. And guess what? How we increase our BDNF? Exercising. You got it. <laughs> so it's all on you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so as Dr. Matiel was talking about, it is a, it does require like perseverance, a lot of advocating for yourself um, as a patient. And it's great when you have strong team to back you up. Um, but I think it does get really, when there's so many comorbidities or overlapping symptoms and maybe other things going on, maybe there are medication effects or just coincidental you have another condition. Um, I find that it becomes pretty hard to manage all these things. I'm wondering, I've heard you know other people mention social work and other things that you can, ways you can get help, but I, I'm unfamiliar with those other methods, so if someone could speak to that. Well, I think it starts with uh, um a good partnership between the neurologist and the primary care physician. And a lot of times we see 
patients, uh, people living with MOGAD or NMOSD being very young and healthy until there's autoimmune attacks. And a lot of times they don't have primary care physicians. And uh, finding a good one is, is the very first step. Um, again, having some other experts involved, sometimes it's the urologist or sometimes it's a infectious disease uh, doctor if there are uh, ongoing infections. Um, and I think spending time to understand um, that some institutions may have all of these and, and making those connections. And sometimes um, you will need to get familiar with a few different clinics and different hospitals. Um, I've seen uh, um, patient advocates and sometimes or concierge practices. Uh, it may work, it may not. Um, I, I think that's, uh, of course, it's always an additional cost and, and cost is, is never um, a trivial uh, factor to, to care. But I, I think if you start with a neurologist who, who knows these conditions, um, that has access to both inpatient when it's needed and outpatient practices, plus a, a, a good primary care physician who is willing to learn. Um, unfortunately, um, most may not know details about these conditions, but many of them are happy to uh, communicate with us and, and go into the, to, to the websites and read some review papers about it. I think th those two are, are definitely the, the most important. The other thing I was going to add is uh, this isn't always possible, but if it, you're if if it's possible, staying within a single healthcare system can often make um, coordination between different specialists significantly easier. Um, we. You know, first of all, people within um, a healthcare system might have particular specialists that they send folks to. You know, uh, Dr. Masiello just mentioned urology, but I really encourage folks who are um, experiencing bladder or bowel symptoms or sexual dysfunction to see a urologist. And we know at Mass General there's a particular uh, urologist who specializes in neurourologic conditions, and that's kind of where we send most of our referrals. Um, but the communication is really at a different level with, um, with most of the doctors who are within the system as opposed to those who are outside. Just because you can see all of the notes, any lab orders that are done, any imaging that's done, you can follow up on it directly. A lot of times behind the scenes, if uh, primary care or rheumatology or urology uh, sees a patient of mine, uh, they'll CC the note that they uh, that they wrote at that visit to me and it goes straight to my inbox. And if I see that there's someone who's following my patients closely and um, you know we're working on the same medications or we're making the same tweaks to medications, I'll just you know through Epic CC them so that they're aware of the changes that are happening. And that takes a lot of load and burden off of you as a patient. Um, if you're working with specialists, you know sometimes folks are trying to see the world specialist in this particular area, but in five different institutions. And that puts a lot of burden on you as the patient. And it also is very, very difficult administratively to actually make, um, to make that work. And it's also difficult to figure out who's kind of leading the show in that, in that situation. So if, if it's possible to kind of stay within um, a healthcare system, or maybe you just have your primary you know, or, or one or two uh, particular specialists outside of that system. I think that, that makes things easier. Great, thank you guys so much. I wanna open it up for um, questions in the audience, please. Please raise your hand if you have anything to ask. Over there to the left side of the room. You are right. Yeah, um, yeah, hi, I'm gonna sit back down. I was just wondering, you know, I'm not trying to advocate one over the other, but it, in all of your studies and your experiences and your patients, do you get any feedback for them regarding, um, you know, things in their diet that could trigger them more so than other things that they were eating, they could be eating? I mean, I know, eat a healthy diet, all of that. But, um, you know, I've heard a few people around the room talking about certain foods bother them a certain way or could cause them to feel a certain way. I don't know if you guys touch on that at all with your patients. 
um, I think that the most information we have is uh, studies in, in, in MS. So because it's a more common problem, it, the identification of this condition has been much longer. And different strategies, different nutrition strategies have been compared. And um, surprisingly, every single diet that is rich in fruits and veggies and very low in sodium and salt or processed foods, sugars, they work extremely well. Um, so using that knowledge for other autoimmune conditions, we do think that when the, the diet's more natural, it has less box or can, it's more like fruits, veggies, and, and lean meats, um, the bioflora, right? So that the bacteria that live in us are happier, more diverse, they help the immune system. That's an area of uh, research of a lot of colleagues at the Brigham and Women's, Dr. Chidney's and other colleagues. Um, other components may be quite specific. If someone is allergic to lactose or allergic to gluten, a celiac disease, we try to, of course, the patient should stay away because by causing these allergies, they are also draining their energy, they're more fatigued. Um, um, we are, I always say that um, lifestyle is so important. It starts with what we eat. I've been relatively struck by the diversity of diets that folks have said work for them. Um, so I've had people who swear by a gluten-free diet or other people who say that a dairy-free diet is really, you know, what makes them feel better and really just um, a huge variety. I haven't seen a single diet that has necessarily been consistent across individuals. But my guidance to anyone is if, if there's a diet that makes you feel like your disease is better controlled or like you feel better, you have more energy, then that's, you know, then that's the diet for you. Um, but I haven't seen one, of, one particular diet across all of the patients that seems to be consistent. That I, so as a result, I don't typically recommend a particular diet to folks who have a new diagnosis or spend um, as much time on that aspect of things. So same here. So we try to use the data that we have learned from multiple sclerosis and somehow translate that into other autoimmune diseases. And we know that the Mediterranean diet is so far the one that we have more data on it. But one thing that I want to say for patients who decided to just to be vegetarian, vegan, I always check and I do recommend to get B12 supplementation because often time goes very low and for sure will make your neuropathy, your brain fog worse, and even though can damage the eyesight. Thank you. I don't I had, I had a follow-up question. Uh, Dr. Mattiello, a couple times you've mentioned, I think, the relationship between an infection possibly triggering uh, an episode of MOGAD or, or flare. And I, was, I wanted to make sure I heard that correctly. And if so, is there a sense that there may be variation between, say, a bacterial infection versus a viral infection? Um, just trying to anticipate, like, <laughs> if something happens with my daughter, when to be most Obviously, we're trying to be vigilant all the time, but trying to have the best kind of signal. No, thanks for the question. Um, we, there are two theories, of course. There's a theory that um, thinks that perhaps when the immune system finds a, a virus or, or a bacteria or even a parasite, it may confound, it may attack that, and. And if there is similarities of such organisms' protein with the myelin proteins, we call this uh, um, molecular mimicry, this could be a way to um, perhaps try to explain why people develop this. Um, fortunately, this is very difficult to prove, and all the trials uh, of trying to, even the big story was EBV and MS, and many negative studies, some positive studies. In NMO and MOGAD, there have been some trials on trying to find this, but no single agent or class of agents. 
what I was talking a little more about was how sometimes um, inflammation that is brought by an infection may make the barrier that protects our brain a bit leaky. Um, and that's very well known in the laboratory. So uh, Dr. Levy and other colleagues who do a lot of the, the models, the, that a lot of times just giving an antibody to that animal model does not cause the disease. They have to cause some inflammation. Um, uh, some of the neuropediatricians, they think that people, especially kids, on IVIG, one of the reasons why they do so well is they never get any infections. Again, this is never studied, never proven, but I have a number of colleagues who say, yep, even those codes or those GIs, uh, you know, that kids have all the time, I, I see my, my own girls, they have infections all the time. With IVIG, they're not there. And maybe that's one way to protect from relapses. Again, not proven, not studied, but um, a gut feeling. It's very interesting. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Hi. Um, so what are your thoughts on holistic treatment? I know you spoke about cannabis, but um, I get like a monthly massage. What about acupuncture, uh, red light therapy, ice baths, any of those um, thoughts on that? Yeah, you mentioned a lot of the ones that I actually do recommend um, to folks. Um, so I think with, uh, with complementary alternative medicines, um, I think that they're, they can be a really good, um, complement to the medications and to the other, um, treatments that, um, that you might receive, uh, in particular because our medications have a lot of side effects, um, and they're not really well tolerated by a lot of, by a lot of people at the doses that are needed to really control pain fully. Uh, pain is a really complicated phenomenon. We know that um, there is a really important component to, um, you know, the, the mind's kind of influence on pain. We know that there, for example, is a really powerful placebo effect. That doesn't mean that it, um, that just means essentially that what your perception of what your pain is going to be alters what the pain experience actually is. And so harnessing that, figuring out ways to, to use that to your advantage, I think is, is really important. The thing that I would say um, is also important is to uh, avoid therapies that are really expensive and ruinously potentially expensive and are uh, potentially, you know, really don't have any basis for, um, for, for improving symptoms. So within the kind of range of complementary medicines, the things that I do recommend are typically acupuncture, massage, um, definitely cold or heat therapy, any kind of exercise or stretch-based therapy. Uh, things that I recommend typically a little bit less or don't recommend is homeopathy. Um, in terms of, um, uh, and then there's, you know, if you're going to a specialist paying thousands and thousands of dollars out of pocket, um, that's an immediate red flag for me because there's just not, you know, there's not necessarily data behind some of these uh, medications. And especially when you see kind of miraculous cures or promises about therapy, it, you know, there's other things to spend, to spend your funds on. And um, it's important to kind of stay away from that. Um, in terms of cannabis, the things that I'm hearing the most from patients, and again, one of my frustrations is that all of the information I have is this is just me echoing back what patients have told me. This isn't information that I have from, you know, randomized control trials, unfortunately, not yet, but hoping to change that. But the things that I'm hearing the most are that it's potentially helpful for pain or for spasticity. There is actually some... Um, there's data from animal models that particularly for spasticity that cannabinoids can be helpful. Um, and then also for potentially anxiety or sleep. And the, um, the thing that is also important with cannabis to understand is that there's a difference between CBD and THC. So THC is something that is more responsible for the high um, and for some of the psychoactive effects of marijuana. 
Uh, it can be the component that is very effective um, or potentially effective and that we're most interested in for that pain spasticity portion. But the CBD is um, probably the component that's more important for the anxiety sleep component. So folks sometimes will use THC more for the, uh, or a kind of higher THC compound for the pain or the spasticity or the um, C higher CBD content for the anxiety or for the sleep. The problem is I don't have expertise as a doctor to tell you about what dose you should use, what dose is safe. Uh, and so I have the same reservations that I have about any other medication, except I just don't have the data. So you have to kind of really take that with a grain of salt, um, and hopefully we'll have more data um, out there, both about people who decide to use it and what their experience is, it is with it, about people who stop using it, and also about people who've never tried it. Great, thank you all. Oh, one more thing, yep. In addition to that, and this is a, like another resource that I tend to share with my patients. Believe it or not, I learned about this from one of my patients, and I decided to look into that. And it does really work, is a functional nutritionist. And it's in addition, is a online, so they do like telehealth video visits, and seems to help with inflammation and managing autoimmune disease. I'd be happy to share this information with Sumaira so she that can pass that along. But they do seem to help. Thank you. Thank you all so much.